Next up, we have John Rhodes, um, who is currently the IT manager at St Vincent's Institute in Melbourne, uh, a medical research institute affiliated with the University of Melbourne. Now, John started his Mac career, it says here, making truly horrific videos of surgical operations, and after realising he was never going to get a job in Hollywood with his showreel of videos of people's bowels being cut out, he moved to administering Macs instead. John and SVI have been running Monkey at SVI since 2010, and legend has it that SVI was the first Monkey site in Australia. Clarifies here with probably not true. But um, uh, some of you will, will have attended uh, John's workshop yesterday, which uh, sounded like it was really exciting and interesting. Um, this is John's sixth time presenting at Xworld. So um, away you go, John. Thank you very much, Marcus. <laughs> So that was a bit about me. Um, people often ask me, what's an SVI? What do you do there? Um, and it turns out that we are the third oldest Victorian medical research institute. So take that, Peter Mac. Uh, and somebody said to me on, on Slack, oh, so you do medical research. Does that mean that uh, you can make things like sharks with freaking laser beams? Sadly not. St Vincent's Hospital's ethic committee takes a dim view on weaponizing fish. So <laughs> instead, we do things like this. Um, with these two little scamps here, they both have a life-threatening condition that will, um, it means that their pancreas is trying to kill them. Um, it's very nasty, so of course, let's cut them out. Um, they're very proud of their scars, and so we, they had their pancreases removed. But the trouble is, if you have your pancreas removed, as you may remember from your high school biology, you can no longer absorb sugar and it, because you need insulin that the pancreas makes. So they're then put on a transplant list, waiting to get a donor transplant from somebody who's died. But then, if you get a donor transplant, the problem there is that you have to be on anti-rejection medicine for the rest of your life and then take antibiotics, and it's a bit of a pain. And given they're quite young, obviously that's a, quite a big ask. So they started up with this uh, new idea of doing an auto-transplant. And so they cut out their pancreas. They uh, put it in an esky. I have several of them at home because they're only single use, and I throw them away. And they fly at business class Qantas. Uh, for some reason, it, it, they struggle to get it through quarantine otherwise. And it comes to our isolator facility, the Sue Alberti, sorry, I couldn't help myself, Islet uh, transplant facility. Um, so the pancreas arrives here. Now, I showed a, pi a picture of this last year, and some people were intrigued. And two things have changed since last year. Firstly, Tony's given me the slot after lunch. And secondly, we've just got some Wi-Fi waterproof cameras. So I thought I might actually show you a bit of the procedure. Uh, so it's quite fun, you go and put your hands in and pretend you're like Homer Simpson in a glove box or whatever. Uh, actually, no, don't do that, I get in trouble. Um, so the pancreas sort of goes through a hatch, there it is, and it's just like a, a steak, you cut off the gristly bits, um, get, rid, get rid of the bits you don't need. Uh, it sort of gets chopped up, and if you've ever had a boost juice, then you'll sort of know the rest of the <laughs> procedure. It's, a, it's nice, isn't it? So they, basically they take out, they isolate the islet cells from the, the rest of the pancreas um, through a procedure of washing, spinning, chemicals, I've got no idea. And it goes into these um, blood service bags. You might, if you've ever given blood or received blood, you might have seen a bag like that. They then get put back on a plane to wherever they are in Australia and uh, a radiologist with a dirty great big needle injects it into their liver through their skin and the pancreas, the, the islet cells live in their liver and carry on making insulin, and they're effectively cured of type 2 diabetes, or in their case, you know, they're not going to die because they don't have the stuff in the pancreas they need. What's I got to do with max security? Nothing. But I was talking to um, <laughs> Tom, who's the program manager of it, and I said, oh, could I, he'd shown me the video. I said, could I get a copy of the video, please? It's really cool. I, I want to show it. And he said, oh, yeah, sure. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm giving a talk on max security. So, oh, max security? Uh, that seems like a strange thing to talk about, doesn't it? I said, well, why? He said, well, you know, Macs don't have security problems, do they? That's why you tell us to get them rather than a PC. So I said, well, it's not exactly what I said. Uh, but it's an interesting sort of perception that people have. And I thought I might try a Ford experiment now. Um, let's say, out of the box, I've got in front of me a brand new MacBook Pro or a Windows 10 laptop, let's say it's a Dell Latitude. I just took it out of the box, give it to a user, that's it. Um, sort of not, not a zero touch deployment, more of a, a zero stuffs deployment where you, you do nothing. Now, to save your arms, does anybody think out of the box the PC is more secure than the Mac? 
unsurprisingly. No hands going up. Okay, so let's repeat that. And instead, we we'll say that the, uh, the laptops go through an IT department, an excellent IT department. They, they put policy on there on the Mac. They do configuration profiles. Uh, we bind it to AD. Put it on the Windows. We apply group policy, like the, the high security policy you might have learned out in the MCSE that nobody ever uses, but does stuff like TLS encryption of file servers and so on. Which one do we think is more secure now? With antivirus, would anybody say that actually the Windows computer is a bit more secure than the Mac? Sticking to guns, no, okay. Maybe not, I don't know. I think maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not. I'm not sure. But it's not really a good, good question anyway because, you know, what is, what is security? I mean, which is more secure? What does that mean? Um, I haven't really defined the concept of security. So let's think about it. What, what, when we think about security, what does it mean to us? Do we think about firewalls? Web proxies, perhaps. I had a great story about uh, security for in a web proxy. A bank banned their developers from accessing Stack Overflow because it's a copy and paste site, and they were very worried that they would people they, the developers would copy source code from the bank and then paste it into Stack Overflow when they're asking a question. Uh, some wag on Reddit suggested that the, what the devs should do is. Uh, go home where no doubt they'd be able to visit Stack Overflow slash careers and find a better place to work. <laughs> Eventually, uh, the bank, the InfoSec team reversed their decision because uh, when the development team came to a uh, quote for their next project, um, they said that it was going to take nine months rather than the usual three simply because without Stack Overflow they didn't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> what about antivirus? Yeah, I think we have a love-hate relationship with it. We, we were discussing it on Slack a while back and sort of came to the opinion that nobody's ever really found a, a virus on a Mac using antivirus, but we, we, we sort of need to keep it there because we find the PC viruses. But what about our users? Are our users our biggest threat? Do we have to educate them? Are they going to do stupid things? Do we need to keep them out of trouble? What about securing our network, net, intrusion protection systems, intrusion detection, that sort of thing? Or should we more, be more concentrating on our clients, our laptops, our desktops, our mobile devices? Or even physical security. Is your data centre locked? Do you, have, uh, do you lock away your network cupboards? Do you have uh, armed security guards and so on in front of it? Perhaps encryption. Maybe you want to hide everything away, safely encrypted. Which, which, which ones of these sort of matter for security? Which one of these is going to have the biggest threat? Which one's going to have the biggest impact on your organisation? Well, I will answer that question later on. But if you're interested, how would you find out more? I mean, you've obviously done well. Here you are, had a talk, you've paid money to come and see, and I'm talking about security, but once you've left here, hopefully you'll be so inspired that you might want to learn a bit more. Well, my recommendation is to go to um, vendor sessions. Uh, this is a list of all of the people in the past 18 months who've invited me to go along to listen about security, and they're pretty good because they normally include breakfast or lunch and quite often drinks at the end. Uh, they're free, and by going to a session, I, in my opinion, this, rather than going to a webinar, you're there. You can't get distracted. You can't just sign up and not go, and it's a couple of hours out of your life. Um, food at the VMI one was fantastic. I, so I think I've got to go. And I think Dell at one point, they even made a, their own cocktail that was Dell Blue, so that was pretty good. <laughs> anyway, I was, I was uh, practicing what I preach, and I went along to this one uh, last year in Melbourne, the Intel Security Innovation Forum, and uh, some pretty good people, as you can see, somebody from uh, Intel, uh, the head of cyber influence at Telstra, and this guy, Major General Stephen Day, who had either the coolest or the daggiest job title ever of head of cyber for the Department of Defence. <laughs> if you're not familiar with the Australian Signals Directorate, they're Australia's answer to the NSA or GCHQ. And they've got the best uh, slogan ever, revealing their secrets, protecting our own. So <laughs> it was really cool. But he, um, he outlined in his talk... Uh, about how the uh, ASD protects Australian government and Australian businesses against nation state hackers. Well, I thought I might take a little time out briefly to address the subject of nation state hackers. Why, why should we care? Why, you, know, you might be thinking, this little old me, I'm in a school, in a small business. Why am I worried about nation state hackers? They're not interested in me. Um, and the last time that um, I gave a shorter version of this talk at Melbourne Admins, I had a couple of points. I said, well, First of all, aim yourself high and think that you're, uh, you, you want to protect against the, the greatest threats that you could possibly face, and then you're covered for everything. And almost as a throwaway, I said, well, 
tools that nation state hackers use will sort of filter down. It's sort of um, frying pans being non-stick from spaceships sort of thing, you know, what the government does in advance a few years later fills now. I wasn't particularly convinced, and then, of course, WannaCry happened, and no more coffee for you. Um, <laughs> and this was a nation state hacking tool, probably used by another nation state that affected everybody. Kim Jong wanted your bitcoins, and so he launched it. So definitely, I think we all need to worry about nation state hackers. Um, so during his talk, uh, Stephen Day, he explained how the Australian Signal Directorate runs an incident response team that monitor and then react when an Australian company has been compromised. And they go along to, I don't know, probably you have to be a pretty big company before you're on their radar, but they go along to speak to the CIO and say, this server here has been hacked, you know, these are the services, you should do something about it. And the CIO then says, oh, thank you very much, calls in his security officers, starts shouting, the proverbial flows downhill, and the problem gets fixed. And they said one day something out of the ordinary happened. They went to talk to the CIO, and he said, oh, you know, thank you very much for telling me that we've been uh, hacked, but how can we fix it? I said, well, nobody's ever asked us that before. And like all good government teams, they said we should have a project, and they went away. <laughs> and they decided that they, well, they'd come up with a list of security techniques and to, to mitigate security threats. What's particularly interesting about this list, I think, is it's not just um, a security researcher or um, somebody looking at best practice or just a list you might see on the, the internet. This is actually from an organisation that is actively defending against and probably actively exploiting some of these things as well. So they, they, they've seen it all. It's, um, it's a pretty comprehensive and, I think, reliable list. So we're just going to talk about the top four. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. The thing that blew me away about this was just like 35 mitigation strategies, so what? But he said, what we discovered is if the organisations who had been compromised that we went out to see had followed just the top four, they would not have been compromised. I thought, wow, that's something special. Um, you know, don't have to go through 35 things. Just four simple things and you're pretty much safe from nation-state hacking. Sounded pretty cool. So, have a think. What do you think your top four would be? And I'll, we'll ask you, at the, once I've set them out, we can see whereabouts they fit and see if you agree with it. But have a think. What do you think should be your mitigation strategies against uh, security threats? Now, here is the list. I've purposely done it small so you can't read it. <laughs> but I, um, I'm going to do them, I'm going to just show you the top four and how they relate to Max. And um, yeah, I've done them slightly out of order, but I've put the, um, the, the ranking of the list um, at the top. So firstly, patch operating systems. Fairly straightforward. I think if you asked John Rosa five years ago what's in a, 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 an update to Mac OS or OS X as it was, I probably would have said, oh, well, there'd be some bug fixes, maybe some feature enhancements, knowing Apple, maybe some feature removals, and maybe some security fixes. Um, but now I think security is pretty important <laughs> and uh, to the, the updates. I don't know if anybody recognises this. This is a direct memory um, attack uh, device. It's about 400 bucks plus the software. And if you plug it in, hopefully this will work, plug it into a Mac, that is um, file vault encrypted by the Thunderbolt. This device literally reaches inside the memory, directly accesses the RAM, and pulls out the password. And so you get it running. I think to add insult to injury, it's a Microsoft Surface that they're hacking a Mac with. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, sorry, it's a bit dark, but basically, yeah, you forcibly restart the Mac. It boots off of the shell that's on the, the device, and on the screen will be password that will then allow you to unlock the Mac. So with this device, pretty much any Mac is, is was vulnerable. Okay, that's the slowest typing ever, sorry. Um, I just wanted to get to the point. So if you want to read more about the attack or the uh, security researcher, there's his details. There was a bit of a time between um, these guys talking about it and Apple actually fixing it. And so Apple finally patched it in macOS 
It's actually three, not two, my apologies, which came in about December of last year. So I wonder how many people here have got Macs in their organisations that are running a version of Mac OS less than 10, 12 free? There's a few. I think there's probably more because this is not just Macs running 10, 12 or 10, 12, 1 or 10, 12, 2. This is all Macs before 10, 12, 3. So running 10, 9, running 10, 10, 10, 11. It seems that Apple didn't actually back port it to any version of the operating system uh, prior to 10, 12, uh, which is a bit of a shock because you know, they fixed it only a few months after the new one came out. Now, I think this should, we should learn from this that actually a new OS release really is a patch just like a normal point release. And you, know, you need to get on the latest version. You, you look where Apple's been before. They're not going to support um, Sierra a day longer than, than uh, when they've released High Sierra. So you need to move pretty quickly. Now, this is obviously a problem with the Southern Hemisphere academic year that you might not want to put out your images until January. But you've pretty much got six months of unsupported um, operating system if you do that. So it's something you probably need to consider. So how do we actually do it? Well, let's make patching easy. Make it simple for the users. Possibly the easiest way if you're not doing any management is Monkey. Install Monkey, set this one key, and that's it. It will just automatically run every day, and it will download all of the Apple updates, and even a non-administrator user can run the, the Apple updates. So if you're doing nothing at all at the moment, just try this. It's super easy. Um, obviously, if you've got a Jamf Pro, um, there are mechanisms in there for doing updates. And actually, Rich Trampton had a nice way of um, putting Apple software updates into self-service um, so that the user can do it themselves. So uh, check that out. Second one, patch applications. I think it's obvious we know which applications we're talking about. Uh, we've got our, our web browsers, our viewer type ones, Java, Adobe Flash, Adobe Reader, Adobe Acrobat, Adobe Macromedia, Adobe this, yeah. Anyway, you get the idea. And it's interesting you say Microsoft. Um, I don't know if you saw Windows, uh, there was a new version of Windows, Windows S, that is sort of similar to iOS, uh, and it was meant to be all secure and sandboxed, and this was Microsoft's brave new step into sort of a more of an iOS world. Uh, it, it got compromised pretty quickly with a Word macro virus. So, <laughs> and they, certainly Word and Excel macro seem to have come back with a vengeance, so that the, the exploit's there. So yeah, keeping Office up to date is pretty important. So how do we patch our applications? Well. Sticking with open source, auto packager and auto package are great ways of doing it. We touched on that uh, yesterday in a workshop and there are quite a few uh, really good tutorials on it online, but basically they will update any applications that, you, that it can find automatically so you don't have to do it. Um, obviously, there's some patch management coming, which we might find out about tomorrow. But then when we're talking about op um, operating system patches and application patches, it's not good enough to simply just push out the patch. You've then got to do some reporting. You need to check that it's out there. You need to check that it's installed. You need to check. So you need a policy then, once you've done your checking to see if the patches have been deployed, for what happens for unpatched or unupdated hosts. I don't know if anybody here does that, but you, know, you might look in your monkey report or your JSS and you, you, you think, OK, well, this isn't working. What, what do you do with all those machines that haven't updated? Well, I suggest that, first of all, you try and fix why it's not updating. Fairly obvious. Then you log a help desk ticket. Get somebody to go to the machine, find out why it's not updating. Maybe it's the user not clicking update. Maybe it needs a restart, but try and do it. Finally, um, quite a few organizations are starting to deny network access if your machine is out of date or if the antivirus hasn't run. Um, Aruba have a thing called On Guard that you, you Basically, you can't join the wireless network unless your client is running at the latest version of antivirus and has all of the updates. It's a bit harsh, but it's something we might need to consider as if these threats get worse and worse. So the number one best thing you can do to protect your Macs is application whitelisting. It's a bit tricky to do on a Mac. Windows has it down pat with software restriction uh, policies. But it's still doable. Um, the simplest way of doing application whitelisting is via path whitelisting. This is what it looks like in Profile Manager. If you tick the box for restricting which apps are allowed to launch, and then in there we said allow these folders, applications. 
That means that only, file, uh, only applications that are in slash applications can run. If you have anything in your desktop or you download, you double click them, it says no, this can't run. This is really handy for machines that are very homogenous, like labs and so on. But for general use, just using the path can be really tricky because there's lots of applications out there that um, run stuff out of the library or in, in sort of annoying places. So uh, for machines that you can tweak this and put it on, then that's fine. But for general use, it's, it's probably not that good. Then we can certificate. We can uh, application whitelist based on certificates. Apple kind of does this for us with Gatekeeper. Um, the idea being that um, your Mac will only run something that has a, 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 a only run an application that has been signed with a developer ID. Uh, and then if Apple hears bad things about the developer, they can then revoke the uh, certificate, I think using XProtect. And then when you go to run it, your Mac will say, no, you can't run this because it's not trusted. I, I've got a bit of a problem with just relying on Gatekeeper. Um, you know, it, what's the number one application you don't want on your... Macs? Anybody? Mac Keeper. <laughs> so I was trying to browse for some educational material online and I discovered that my, my Mac was infected with free viruses. <laughs> Who knew that a web page could tell me that? And you'll never guess what was suggested that I download to fix it. And now when I first gave this talk, I was actually using Marcus's laptop to present and I had hoped to demonstrate Gatekeeper working by, down, so by downloading MacKeeper and then running it on Marcus's laptop. <laughs> it turns out he was already a, subscri a sub su subscriber, yeah. so it's a kind of ruined that one for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> MacKeeper. <laughs> but it turns out that MacKeeper is signed, which surprised me. And I was like, so weird. Apple is not blocking it, and I think it's probably because the, the sort of the really Scummy practices are all through affiliates, saying you've got a virus and then they get their, their kickback when you download MacKeeper. Um, but forget MacKeeper for the moment. It just highlights the problem with relying on, on Gatekeeper as a sole way of um, protecting your applications. Really, I don't think it's whitelisting when it's a massive list like that. Instead, I think it is blacklisting. And so, very wise Mac security person once said, an application whitelist you don't control is in fact a blacklist. Uh, that's me. <laughs> so, <laughs> up to date. Up to date indeed. <laughs> so is there a better way? Well, um, Google have come out with a product, not really a product, come out with an open source program called Santa. And it's interesting when you think about Google because you know when we talk about nation state hacking, we kind of think that we're being hacked by foreign nation states. Of course, Google has to contend with being hacked by its own nation state. So um, they're very security conscious, as you would imagine. And I thought I'd just show you what it looks like. So once you've downloaded the client,
Um, so, yeah, so we definitely need a server. Um, I say be Google. Um, was it Clay Kavanos was on the Mac Admins po podcast, and he said a lot of the, the trouble with a lot of the um, Google products is like the first step is to download and compile the application, and the second step is be Google to have their infrastructure. Um, they have this crazy system apparently where they go um, where if an application has been installed by two other people, then that allows it to run on everybody's um, Mac, and it's pretty interesting. But the central server is, is quite good, but really it would be much better, I think, if we could combine it with an existing Mac management tool. And so this is maybe a shout out to uh, anybody who could help us there. Um, perhaps one that already has an agent, perhaps a, a Mac tool that has a server, and maybe even one that is doing our software installation, because then it can pick up the hashes at that point. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, I sent an email on the monkey mailing list, and Greg Nagel told me to go, go away. Uh, <laughs> no. Before anybody from Jamf tells me, there it is on Jamf Nation. So, a few more upvotes wouldn't hurt. Um, the second one, which is a bit more specific to getting it to do center, I don't even know what rank it is because it's got so few votes, but maybe if we can make that 140, um, we might get a bit more traction. Of course, the Mac does actually have a built-in application whitelisting, which is parental controls. Um, it's probably the main reason we don't use it is basically <laughs> our users don't particularly like being told that their parents says they can't do anything. Um, do you know If they change the name, it would actually be fairly feasible to use it. So the fourth most effective one, restrict admin privileges. Now, I'm not really going to talk much about this because it's, you, you get pretty opinionated and uh, heated discussions. But the ASD, this is their recommendation, and I think they put it better than I could. Um, so have a look there. If you are trying to fight the fight to get admin, admin privileges revoked for your users, um, then you can perhaps use this as a tool to do it. Um, all four of these things I've just shown you are mandated for Australian government computers. So every government computer must adhere to all four of those nowadays. So it's a pretty good precedent. So that was the top four and how they relate to Macs. What did anybody think that should, something else that should have been there or another security thing? Use education. OK, I'm going to make a list. Anybody else? What else are we missing? What else security do you do, do, you, do you Macs? No? Full disk encryption. Oh, brilliant. Anything else? I do. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'm going to move on and stop asking. Okay. Yep. So SSO two factor sort of thing. Well, let's have a look at where some of those things would have been on the list. I, the ones that I assume that people would have said, and turns out you haven't. Um, antivirus. Interestingly, signature-based antivirus, which is what we all think of when we think of antivirus, is at number 30, which shows you just how ineffective it really is. Um, the host-based detection that I put on there, I've, I've left it there simply because I think the only way you can get it is as part of an antivirus client. But really, antivirus is, is ranking very low down. Um, and I guess if you're doing application whitelisting, you kind of don't really need antivirus just because it can't run. Firewalls, security, it's, it's there, network segmentation, so on. Not too worried about firewalls, although we all seem to hate them and the people who run them. Two-factor authentication, sort of ties in with SSO. How many people have uh, their JSS available on the web? That are, and how many people have set up two-factor? Their JSS. Okay, well, wow. it just released, I think, in the well, version before. This is it running on SVI. What we're using here is Duo service with an on premises DAG server, which I love the name of. Um, so when we try to go to our JSS, it kicks us off here. We then get a push, not get a push notification on the phone, prove it, yes. Oh, no, so send me a push, click yes. And then I get signed in and pay no attention to the unupdated versions of Chrome when I talk about how you should do patching. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is really cool doing it this way because um, it means that none of our accounts are stored in the JSS, they're not sitting there in MySQL um, and the, the accounts aren't even stored in the Duo DAG device, instead they, they're just uh, queried in real time 
from Active Directory. Um, if you're curious, I think to sign up for Duo Security, it's about $6 a month per user. So it's not exactly a, a big cost. Steve? And you That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> sure. So <laughs> how do you deal with APIs? How do you deal with APIs? Because we've got the problem to factor authentication that the second we turned it on, we couldn't get to any of the APIs anymore, obviously. Um, I think that's really a question for Jamf uh, to sidestep it. Um, call support. Call support. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> sorry, I don't have an answer for that. But um, yeah, no, it, it's, it's pretty new. There are quite a few improvements that could be done to their SAML. A um, couple of absolutely insane default settings, which um, they're quite highly voted up on Jamf Nation. So I, Suggest that you put your feature request there. Um, so if you have a look, there's the, um, the guide, the admin guide explaining how to do the single sign-on with that. And Duo uh, have got an absolutely excellent um, guide on how to integrate the, the JSS with their, their DAG appliance. Logging seems pretty important stuff. We were at Splunk for our Mac admins uh, talk recently, and you know just aim all of your syslogs and all of the other logs at, uh, at something like Splunk or Elk and uh, make sure you look at them rather than just sort of <laughs> proactively, rather than just looking at them when things go wrong. For all you DevOps fans, um, I thought that was interesting at 21, use DevOps. Um, <laughs> and then 27, restrict access to server message block, SMB. So this is Windows, Windows file sharing. I thought when I read that before, that's a strange thing to put on a security list. Who would be stupid enough to have a Windows file server on the internet? Uh, and uh, as we discovered, well, WannaCry exploits exactly that, and there were a huge amount of people who did have publicly facing Windows file servers. It's interesting, I mean, who would have even have thought about that? Well, I guess an organization that is knowing your secrets might well have been using that exploit. User education. Um, I, I read a great story recently how uh, a company um, you know, did a phishing as a service um, on their, their users, and 30% of their users failed the phishing test. They all clicked on the link. Uh, and so they then took that to their management and said to the management, we need to have some user education based on this, so give us the budget to do it. They came back a month later after the user education, and 35% people clicked <laughs> on the link. <laughs> I don't. I, I kind of think um, user education. It's a. It's a bit like when my daughter goes to daycare. If she sticks her hand in the crack between the door and the hinge, it's not really her fault. They should have had a guard on there and they should have been watching. You know, sure we're going to tell her, don't stick your hand in the door. But at the same time, we kind of need to give our users a safe place so that they can't do stupid things like put their hand in their door. So. Full disk encryption, file vault, not there at all. Not on the list. I, I find that interesting. Um, I think the list is quite hackery and sort of from remote hackers and so on. So to actually exploit full, dis, um, you know, uh, to get a hard drive out of a Mac, you kind of have to have physical access, which is generally not what's happening, which I think why it's lower down on the list. I, I think really full disk encryption benefits sort of accidental data breaches. You know, somebody leaves a laptop on a train and a random person gets it and it ends up being in the Herald Sun rather than hacking. Still worthwhile doing, but uh, not that important for them. So what should you take home from this? The greatest threats were all client side. None of them were network or anywhere else. This is our SVI's firewall. It does intrusion protection. I was, I was so excited when we got it. I was going to find all of these exploits and things that were coming out. I think so far it's discovered one single um, Android phone that was in a botnet. So. You know, we, we paid over $60,000 for that. I imagine people at universities and so on have million dollar firewalls, at, at least, you know, when you consider the project costs. So if you're a hacker, you're not going to attack a hardened security device like that. It's not the, you know, it's much easier to go to your clients. So that's why I think we all need to be aware that actually the, the greatest threats to security for our organizations are things that we control. Everybody here is an Apple admin. Everybody here is looking after client devices. It, it's your area. It's your responsibility. It's not your InfoSec team. It's not your firewall. Actually, 
we all in this room can make the biggest difference to security for our organization. Bear in mind this list, I would say it's as close as we've got to best practice. It's a very special term for uh, people who do risk management best practice. You know, one day you may be held accountable. Somebody might be saying, why weren't you doing this? This is the Australian government recommendations. Why is your company not adhering to it? So, how, how should we actually look at um, making sense of this? How, how should we implement it? What should we do? And I have a security, again, that great security, uh, Mac Edmund researcher came up with a, sec a security implementation mantra. Step one, implement. Look at the list, do it. This should be your default position. Not, should we do this, but let's do this and let's see what, what problems are we going to have doing it. If you can't implement, and I'm sure lots of people want to tell me about you can't take away people's active, um, administrative rights when they're on BYOD, um, you've got to mitigate. Now, if you don't mitigate, and if you do just take away things and make your users' lives hard, you may get presents like this, which I got from an <laughs> angry user <laughs> <laughs> who I hadn't wow. given a, a lightning cable to. <laughs> I was somewhat wise to it and opened it in a box rather than it going everywhere on my desk. That's surprisingly tasty. Yeah, that's, uh... <laughs> so, so what does mitigation look like? Well, I, I was, uh, got a call from one of our senior people and they said, um, we have this device up here, it's not printing. And um, one of the service desk guys goes up, have a look, and he goes, John, you really need to go and have a look at this. I right, walk up there, and I'm very suspicious. If you work in science, you might know that this, this is an HP, HPLC. HP haven't made HPLC since 1999 when they sold them off. So the computer attached was a little bit vintage. And I said to the guy, I said, look, you need to get another one, throw it away, buy a new one. He said, okay, can I have $120,000 out the IT budget, please? I was like, IT budget? Is that? No. <laughs> So we carved off a corner of the network, and that printer is actually on our. So that computer is on our network, but it can only talk LPR to our Cups print server. That's all it can do. We have, in theory, mitigated the risk. I'd say finally, if you can't mitigate, then you really need to justify and think why aren't we doing this? You know, if you don't agree with some of your policies, you need to bring them up with your management. You need to put them through risk management. And, you know, maybe in the end, have it documented, a bit of covering your ass. Otherwise, you know, you can end up in court and somebody's saying, why didn't you do this? So I think you've got to justify. As I said, that was the road security implementation venture. <laughs> <laughs> so, to conclude, this is IT best practice. But make the list work for you, not against it. Take it to your management say, this is what we should be doing. Um, and I think it's... Um, so, you know, I, I don't think you can argue too much with the list. You can be quite, a, you know, you might have your opinions about how it's going to work for you, but really, these are the greatest um, threats that your company is, is, and your organisations are facing. So you need to deal with them. And thank you very much. The obligatory picture of me being a bad parent with my son, <laughs> Tricky Wine. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.